it started, uh, I don't really remember where or when I started seeing the work, but as I started seeing it, I felt like I was seeing it in a lot of different places. And I, it's, it's rare for me to find intersection between arts and sports or illustration. I mean, there are a lot of illustrators that have done that. I feel like there aren't as many that are sort of as prevalent now, you know? Uh, so I myself being a fan of various sports and especially of martial arts, of well, being fans of martial arts, your, your, your work stood out to me. And I think also on a subconscious level, I connected with it because uh, like I, I felt that there was this like graphic design know-how and quality to, to the work. Uh, so yeah, thank you. Thanks so much, <laughs> yeah, thanks so much man. <laughs> um, let's start off by talking about this piece behind us right here. This, this mural, um, would you call it a mural or what would you call this? Well, for me, when I think of murals, I think of a lot of suffering. Uh, <laughs> because, and for this one, I was spoiled because I'm like in a gallery and, uh, you know, I had the uh, privilege of using a projector for a couple of days, taking my time. Um, uh, usually when I go on mural jobs, it's like a mission, you know, I gotta have, uh, get it done in a, usually a quicker window of time, uh, you know, especially if it's outdoors, uh, I gotta get it up. Um, so I'm not getting harassed by a lot of people on the street. Uh, so this is actually, this is actually more like a large scale painting and it's a lot more relaxing uh, job for me than a typical mural job. So how do you draw the line between what's a mural and what's a painting? Is it based on size or, or based on medium? Uh, well, yeah, I, I would say more size. I mean, I think the definition of mural is uh, just a painting on the wall, like on the physical wall or uh, as opposed to, but yeah, I think definitely size plays a factor. Yeah, I do remember when we first started talking about the show, we actually thought about getting on this very wall. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was like, hmm, it's difficult to sell. Yeah, <laughs> I think you made the right call with that one. <laughs> um, what is the smallest mural you've ever done? Um, the smallest mural I've ever done? I mean, they're all, they've all been pretty big. Um, they've all been in uh, maybe like maybe like 20 feet or something because they all cover, I've only done murals that have covered a whole wall. So, um, and they've been in gyms um, and stores. So, they've usually been at least a couple stories. Cool. Can you, can you, um... I guess makes a lot of sports. Oh, well, I mean, I guess I, so I started out doing uh, a couple of murals at some fight gyms. Um, actually, the first mural I got hired to do was um, in, uh, not Abu Dhabi, where is it? Qatar. And uh, yeah, so it was a Muay Thai mural in their like fight room. Um, and then I did some murals in my own uh, Muay Thai gym in uh, New York City. But so, you, so your first gym was, I mean, your first mural was all the way in the top. Yeah. That's awesome. So yeah, so all the way out there. Yeah. I mean, how, how, how I got the resources out there. <laughs> Did they just hit you up? Yeah, yeah. So um, uh, when I had first started doing my artwork for Fightland, my editorial artwork for Fightland, I got a lot of exposure in the fight community. So uh, I guess people out there had heard about me and, uh, I got the opportunity to fly out and do that. Uh, besides that, I really haven't done too many murals. Um, I had the opportunity to do a mural at a Jordan store in China. Uh, that was really interesting. And I felt, they made me feel real slow because they were building the store while I was doing the mural. They were literally like, I mean, I, I spent a, a less than a week during the mural and they spent less than a week building the whole store, like with a, uh, basketball courts and like doing the finishing and putting, setting up his displays and everything. So um, that was quite an interesting experience. I, I imagine they had a lot more staff than you know. Yeah, and those guys are hardcore. Uh, when they, their work crews, uh, at least where I was at in, in China, they, they come in and they sleep there until it's done. They're like working 
they live there and then they get the job done and they're they go home. I guess kind of like me. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you told me you slept at some of these places. Oh yeah. Well, uh, when I got hired to the Qatar mural, um, that was my first ever uh, like kind of serious mural job, and I was out there by myself. So, um, and I, so I pretty much just stayed. Oh yeah, I wanted to start at a time that wouldn't interfere with the classes going on. So I basically stayed on American time. And I was like, just if you guys just, uh, you know, give me the key, let me stay here. I'll just work at night and, you know, I can sleep in one of these rooms. Uh, so, and I was there by myself anyways. And uh, so, uh, yeah, that was, that, that was very much uh, like a solo lone wolf mission. Cool. So, from your first, like, what was the learning curve like? Because you know, having never done a mural before, mm -hmm. Did you talk to people? Did you research stuff? Yeah, I mean, I, I think um, what I did was I started out with a composition that, and a limited color palette that I knew I could execute. So my first couple were just black and white. Uh, that's my wheelhouse. I think the, the, the most challenging part was translating the textures that I use on a small scale painting to a large scale painting, you know, because the rollers that I use on regular paints are gonna make the same kind of impact uh, large scale. But I think fortunately, uh, a lot of the techniques I developed planning for the mural helped me in my smaller scale paintings because uh, I kind of got like experimenting with wilder textures on the, on the larger painting, on the larger murals and incorporated them in my smaller work. Like uh, some of the experiments I did were um, using like crumpled up aluminum foil and dipping that in uh, paint. It, that kind of gave me like larger chunky textures that on a large scale look like the textures that I uh, can create using rollers on a smaller scale. Things like that. Yeah, that's cool. So, um, so like take this for example, walk, walk us through a bit of the process of how you created this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, and actually one more thing. Um, uh, the, the murals really helped me with uh, the planning, you know, because um, before doing mural work, a lot of the work that, um, uh, a lot of the commercial work that I've been doing, uh, the final artwork has to be delivered digitally. So I have a little bit of leeway in how I create the artwork. You know, sometimes I don't want to get a little bit experimental with certain brush strokes, or uh, I want to experiment with a different type of medium. I can paint that on a different piece of paper, or if I have a really complicated composition, like multiple figures, and I don't feel like figuring it out too, you know, too precisely, I could paint the figures separately and then I'll scan them in and I'll collage them digitally. But, you know, you obviously can't do that with the mural. So uh, for something like this, uh, all the work that I did for the mural murals uh, helped me plan something like this so I could have everything real tight and uh, executed on a uh, finished surface. Yeah. yeah. I think you work. It's pretty awesome to see. It's like, <laughs> very efficient. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. To answer, to answer your question um, about the process of this is uh, something else I got from the murals, like uh, working on that Nike mural. Uh, going through that process, I had to basically flesh out and solve all the problems in the sketch because it has to get, it had to go through multiple levels of approval. You know, I can't just, they can't just hire me and I show up at the Jordan store and I uh, just paint whatever I want. It, uh, you know, it went through multiple rounds of revisions. So by the time I got to China, it was all locked in and I just projected it and I just had to execute, you know, uh, to a finer level of detail. So. That's the type of approach that uh, I started taking to larger scale paintings. Um, and so, yeah, to answer your question, it starts with tight sketches. I figure out all the problems that I need to have. Uh, you know, of course, there's always gonna be levels to play with, like particularly textures, um, uh, you know, different, maybe I can experiment with uh, different types of material and substrates, but as far as composition, color, uh, subject matter, lighting, I try to solve all those problems before I go into a large piece. So I'm not going back and forth and wasting a lot of time.
Um, what are some mistakes you've made in the past 10 years? Oh, dude, black. But, you know, I would say one, one thing I learned was, um, no, one technique I learned is uh, to not so much go back and forth. Because what I would do is, like, when I first started doing a mural is my sketch wouldn't be that tight, and then I would approach it like a painting. But the thing with the mural is you're so close to it, you can't really get the grasp of the whole composition. So I would climb the ladder, I'd make like a thing on the nose, which I thought looked right, and I'd climb back down and walk across the street, and I'm like, oh, it looks good. And then I'd come back. I spent forever doing that. So what I would do is um, I, I, I uh, take a picture of where I'm at at the end of the day. I, I like uh, um, put, it, put it into Photoshop. I make all the little marks I have with my tablet. Like I need to make a little bit of shadow on the eyes. I need to put a little highlight on the shorts. Boom, 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 I have it all. And then I just have that on my phone, like as an animated GIF, like before, after, before, after. So when I'm on the wall, I'm like doing a checklist. I'm like eyes, you know, shorts, arm, boom, boom. And then um, because it's a little bit more efficient that way. So I'm not uh, wasting a lot of time going back and forth. Yeah, I just thought of something. Have you ever thought about trying like Having like a webcam. Oh yeah, I had heard about that, but you know, there's things like uh, when I've done a mural on the street. Oh, you know what? I, yeah, I haven't actually done that, but that's a that's a great idea. Like have a GoPro and have it right out of the money camera. Yeah, it's a good idea. Maybe, <laughs> maybe next time. Um, so you may have mentioned what was your biggest mural to date? Um, it's probably the Jordan mural because it was like multiple stories. Uh, I, I don't remember the size off the top of my head, but it was started at the bottom of the stairwell, and then you kind of go up the stairwell, and then it went to the ceiling. Uh, but at least two stories. Wow. Um, you mentioned one where you were painting live. This isn't necessarily a mural. You were painting live, and there was like a UFC type. Yeah, that type of uh, get together. Can you uh, tell us a bit about that story? So I've been fortunate to work with Reebok, who uh, was the official outfitter of the UFC uh, on multiple occasions, uh, because they uh, have a lot of in-person events, especially around uh, around the fights. So they'll do athlete signings at the Reebok stores. Um, but I. Uh, one event uh, that I was very fortunate to be invited to was uh, one of the UFC athlete retreats. And it's basically a retreat for all the, all the, all the whole UFC roster. So in Vegas. So I was basically in Vegas uh, in a resort with like 300 of the baddest dudes in the planet uh, in one hotel. And um, I was just painting in the middle uh, with everybody. And uh, so with something like that, um, I think with, with my mural process, I'm not, I wouldn't say I'm much of a showman. Um, you know, like there's guys with cans or um, styles that are a little bit looser that are a lot more entertaining to watch. You can see them building the piece right there. You know, they're just laying the colors on. So for something like that, I think that's what they were thinking, you know, like having me there. But I was like, you guys should better fly me out like a week earlier so I can paint these things to a good level in my hotel room. And then basically when we had the show, I was just like filling in colors and stuff like that. So um, they don't know how hard this is. They don't know your process. Yeah, they don't know that my real face is super boring to watch. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, so you were talking about performance. I mean, do you could, I was mentioning guys like Kim Jong Ji. How do you feel about, how do you feel about painting as performance? Um, do you ever, do you ever consider what you do to be more performative? Like, I know there's, it's not necessarily common for you to have an audience. Yeah. But I mean, I think I, I'm like the opposite of Kim Jong Ji. Uh, for you, you guys that don't know, he's, he's basically, I think he's, um, he has a photographic memory or something. He's just a guy who just starts drawing a line 
and then it just is like a printer almost like it just becomes and that is amazing i feel like i'm the opposite of that like i do a lot of planning um i you know i solve everything in the sketch i do all the tricks to make it as easy as possible for me so i'm not doing anything amazing so for me i would not say i'm a performance artist but i respect the guys that can do it and uh i think it just depends on your style um you mentioned you have a mural coming up in Portland. Yeah. And it's very likely that it's going to rain there. How <laughs> do you deal with that? Uh, I mean, the pain. You know what? I, I've never worked on a mural in the rain, but I lived in Portland for a year. And I think, especially this time of year, it rains at least half, half of the days in the month. Uh, so we'll see. I think we'll see. <laughs> we scheduled a couple more days. Um, hopefully it's like, you know, we'll just pop out of the pockets when it's not raining. Um, you know, I use acrylic, so it's not the longest drying paints. Um, maybe I'll set up some tarps. I got to figure it out. Yeah. <laughs> well, you got some suggestions. <laughs> so tarps is a good idea. Yeah. Um, so <clears throat> this being your first solo exhibition, um, you mentioned working a little differently. What was your thought process in building the series? And what were some of the challenges? Well, basically for me, um, the, the bulk of my work is uh, uh, commercial work. So I, 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 appreciate, I uh, approach this as pretty, uh, pretty much the biggest commercial project I've ever done. Uh, so I laid out the sketches and the plans for the entire body of work at once, and then I proceeded to work on the entire body of work layer by layer, as opposed to like, you know, one thing, because that's, that's how I, I think that that's the most efficient way to do it for me. And that's how I approach all my projects. You know, you gotta do it. You gotta start with a sketch and build it layer by layer. So I just did the whole thing at once. Um, I think, you know, one of the challenges uh, that I faced is, uh, I think what I said earlier, uh, that the final product is physical paintings. You know, it's, I, it's for the commercial jobs, I, can, I deliver digitally. So if I'm running out of time and I want to do some motion lines and stuff, I can just do it on another piece of paper real quick and then collage it in Photoshop. So uh, this was a lot of planning. It's not uh, totally unlike stuff I've done before, but uh, I've never done it to this scale. Um, but I did develop a technique or found the technique online <laughs> and utilized it uh, that, that I've never done before. Uh, and that's um, um, in my emotions, which usually paint on a different type of surface uh, with my final painting. So on some of these black and white paintings, um, um, I create motion lines. I create motion lines uh, a, a myriad, uh, a bunch of types of ways, but one of my favorites is painting with acrylic paint on a non porous surface. So the, the look of it is very liquid and wet and it contrasts with the more grittier textural quality of the figures. So I wanted a, a way, so usually I'll paint it on this type of surface and I'll paint the painting on a different type of surface and then just collage in Photoshop, like I said, but I wanted to have that effect on final pieces of painting. So what I did was uh, I found a transfer technique using acrylic gel medium. So I did the motion lines on uh, a non porous surface. In this case, it was a thin piece of plastic. I planned it out and I you know, uh, made the lines. Then I covered my final substrate with acrylic gel medium. I put them together, I put some books on, and weights on them. Uh, and the next day I peeled it off and it trans the paint transferred kind of like a temporary tattoo. That might be going a little too deep, but. Uh, I was pretty happy with that, with how it turned out. Oh, um, I, saw, I saw a video of that on your uh, Instagram. Yeah, 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 yeah. So is that, is that something that you're, you're planning to take to the next, the next, the future exhibitions? Like, I guess, yeah. like, what are you, what is something you've learned from this exhibition, techniques or otherwise, that you're planning to take on to? Yeah, you know, I do want to experiment a little bit more with that, because uh, while I was applying the transfer, I was like, wow, this is cool. I could do multiple layers of transfer too, you know, like I could do kind of multiple paintings and then overlay them and transfer on top of each other and then do some painting with the different types of texture and then lay some more stuff on top of that. 
Um, but for this body of work, I had the plan uh, and um, I pretty much executed, uh, you know, based on my original vision. I think in the future, maybe I'll play around, do a little bit more experiments before I uh, lay out the plan and uh, maybe come up with something a little bit more unexpected. Um, I know you like to, you said you mentioned uh, painting with aluminum foil. Yeah. Uh, what are some other unconventional materials that, um, that uh, you found surprisingly useful? Uh, a lot of stuff from Home Depot, actually. Um, but before I answer this, I feel like I gotta uh, say thanks so much to my one of my professors in college, George Pratt. He was a master of mark making and mixed media. He was he was actually the one that uh, instilled in me just the concept of mark making, not just drawing or painting. Because when you think of drawing or painting, you're like pencil shading. You know, painting you think of you do a paintbrush, oils. And George Pratt was all about um, creating the atmosphere and the tone or the shape using whatever ways, uh, you know, whatever met methods you want to do. Whatever, if you want to create a shape, uh, you know, a tree, um, a figure, and you want to make, you, you want to form the shadow, no matter, uh, using what, whatever you want. So um, a lot of my tools that um, I, I find them at Home Depot, like I, I try to select tools that'll give me a little bit less control. So I'll get a, some unexpected mistakes, you know, uh, that could possibly enhance the abstraction um, that I'm trying to go for to emphasize the movement or motion or whatever. Um, so I think it's rel relinquishing a little bit of control with the tool to give you some unexpected mistakes. Uh, and that, I, for me, creates some visual interest. What's the best special I can use? <laughs> yeah, yeah, so uh, I feel like you saw me uh, use this rubber, rubber spatula. I think we got it as a wedding present, but uh, <laughs> it, it works a little bit like, um, uh, like a, um, what do you call it? Um, anyways, palette, like a palette knife, but it's a little bendier, so I can go around curves and stuff with it. So, it, you know, it's, it doesn't make sense because it's like, it's, it's a crude, um, crude tool, which I choose on purpose to give me less control, but then I like this rubber one because it gives me a little bit more control, so it's, you know, whatever. <laughs> Have you used anything weirder, like a sandal? <laughs> <laughs> a sandal? Uh, no, I mean, like, I use, like, um, oh, actually, you know what? I did experiment making my own rollers. Like, I, I like, wrapped some rope around um, different rollers. And, I felt like this show was not the time to do it yet because I this is my first show and I was like I, I want to execute I want to have my whole body of work I don't have time to mess around but um, I think I'm gonna have a lot more experiments with my own rollers um, a lot of things I do I have experimented with the past is actually changing the texture of my substrate that's something I've learned uh, painting the murals you know like hitting on different types of old bricks and stuff I use I use the you know I can scrape my paddle and I on the surface, and that will give me different types of textures too. So, um, yeah, those are different ways uh, of creating some visual interest. I like how you lean into martial arts and competitive sports in general. Uh, what are some aspects of your work that you want to transcend beyond the subject matter? Well, you know, hopefully. Uh, some of the elements of my work that people respond to are the composition and the juxtaposition of some of the abstract textures and uh, the precision of the characters. You know, so it's not just about fighting, but maybe you get a sense of the energy and motion of the figures that I could apply to action heroes, whether it's in comics or uh, different athletes. In other sports, um, hopefully people uh, pick up on the energy uh, that I try to express in the, in the, in the work. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about your graphic design background and how that sort of shaped your 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I double majored in illustration and graphic design at uh, VCU, Virginia Commonwealth University. Um, uh, like I said before, uh, when I was in college, my first love was illustration. That's when the art department gave, the art departments gave their uh, department presentations of type of work. Illustration is what I love, but I didn't see that. You know, I wasn't really, I couldn't really wrap my head around that as like a real career. And I had uh, an uncle who was a graphic designer and a couple of cousins who were graphic designers. And that was kind of my only real example of like, this is a real job you can get doing uh, creative work. So, and I was interested in it at the time, you know, in high school, you don't know anything about graphic design, you don't know what that is, but uh, PCU had a really good graphic design school. So, a uh, really good graphic design program. So um, uh, I enjoyed that a lot, but I still love illustration, but I, there's a lot of things that I, I picked up on um, from my schooling in graphic design. I think mostly composition and shape, color. Um, and I think uh, it's also like the building blocks of good illustration. You know, like one thing they stress uh, as an illustration student is thumbnails. And the reason why is because uh, the theory that if your composition can work at a very small scale, design the right shapes, it's gonna work at a bigger scale because all you're doing is just embellishing, adding more details, more textures. But if you can design all the shadows, the shapes, the compositions at a smaller scale, then that's, that's the structure of the piece. And that's the same thing with the graphic design, you know? except that the things they use are typography, blocks, blocks of text, you know, pictures. Um, they have, it's actually more of an emphasis on that. Uh, whereas sometimes in illustration, you just want to get to the shading or something, you know, like, uh, so. It's almost, I, like, it's almost yeah. like the old masters who, that were the, back when they didn't separate graphic design and illustration, it's all it's the artist or whatever. Um, yeah. When was the last time you? Well, before I go on, is there any questions from the audience? Yes, go ahead. Uh, are the uh, question was, how do you go about shading the like, so like the, the white and the, the swish area? Gradients. Oh, the gradients? Um, uh, like a watercolor. Uh, I feel like that's kind of one of the easier parts because there's, uh, it, it's a little bit more room for error because it, you know, uh, when I'm doing like the motion lines, I'm trying to get a balance of black and white that uh, gives a little bit of energy. So, uh, I just diluted my paint with water and um, had a couple of passes until I got a black and white balance that I liked. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> Go ahead. I first saw your work was in the Bruce Lee Center. Yeah. I wonder if you found out. Dude, I don't know how they find out about me, but I, I attribute a lot of, uh, I think a lot of art directors find my work through the early Fightland work that I did, uh, which was uh, Vice's editorial uh, fight publication. So, you know, uh, luckily for me, the MMA community is really tight online. So I think at that time, Fightland was pretty big and anyway, a lot of people who were in the MMA uh, up on it pretty well. But as far as the Criterion collection, um, yeah, I mean, I think maybe, you know, I gotta ask the art director. <laughs> I gotta ask the art director. But um, I had done some Bruce Lee work for my for my friends who are amazing artists, Plastic Cell. Uh, they make uh, hand sculpted, uh, hand cast, and hand painted uh, art sculptures. And I, they did a uh, limited edition, um, officially licensed Bruce Lee figure. So I did the box art for them originally. And actually, the art director of Criterion uh, referenced that. He was like, basically, you should do this. <laughs> but 
you know, he has like a different kind of concept, but basically based on that. Well, you know what? Um, I think ever since I was a kid, I loved drawing and painting my favorite action heroes. You know, like one of the things I was really influenced by is um, the instruction manuals of uh, the Street Fighter game, where they have the full figure illustrations on the characters, where it's really, you know, it, it was like this like full figure and it's focused on the attributes of the character, like their fighting style. Uh, you know, sometimes they even have their stats, like where they're from and where you really get a sense of their personality. So I think just that's, I, th I think this kind of mid-level um, range is my favorite to work in. You know, I think even in college when we have like background type assignments and stuff like that, um, I think the action shot, the pinup shot was the thing that uh, called me the most because it's where you get the most action and uh, I think you can draw the most, more, most personality out of the, the fighters. Oh, uh, thank you. <laughs> no, man, it's, it's all. The question was, the question was yeah. uh, where do you get your reference for, for your paintings? Oh, yeah. Uh, well, after doing a lot of sketches, I mean, so if you were to look through my phone, you'd be a little freaked out because it's basically photos of me or my wife, uh, just like shirtless under, <laughs> in our kitchen, uh, trying to act like Bruce Lee. Basically, so um, basically, you know, I, I, I watch a lot of MMA and stuff like that, so I have a lot of ideas of the movements of composition that I, um, uh, I want to work with. So I'll develop the compositions kind of out of my head, or I'll have some reference. But when it comes to uh, comes to the final artwork, I shoot tight references like. I, uh, you know, uh, the teacher that I uh, mentioned before, George Pratt, he's a representative painter as well. So he was like, you should use, you know, if your goal is to achieve some kind of realism, then you should design your references to help you as much as you can. <laughs> um, you know, lighting and everything is are tools that I use to shape the black and whites for the piece, you know, like, especially when I do stuff that's black and white, it's a lot more reliant on the types of shadows and lighting that I design for the piece to work. So after I come up with the type composition, um, then I'll just try to, you know, act it out, you know, we'll uh, design the lighting so the shadows are, I have the right balance of light and darks, and I create uh, a reference, reference board. Um, and yeah, I rely a lot on that. I rely a lot on that. There's a lot. I did see some of the photos that you showed me. <laughs> it's like them in a small apartment trying to, <laughs> to light it properly and uh, do all the posing. Yeah. So that's actually a good segue. Uh, I know you do some martial arts yourself. What are some uh, martial arts that you personally study? <laughs> well, I did karate when I was a kid, you know, because of Ninja Turtles, uh, all that. And um, uh, when I got to college, uh, I found Muay Thai, which um, I enjoyed very much and uh, still practice to this day. Well, except for this last year, where um, pretty much the longest time I haven't been at the gym, uh, the kickboxing gym. Yeah. Um, when was the last time? Did you ever compete? Yeah, I, so I have fought amateur Muay Thai, but um, I'd say I do it more to work out. You know, that that fight of life is a different type of life. <laughs> um, what are some of the things 
attitude or words and things like the spectator may not appreciate or notice. Hmm. Um, okay, well, I think one thing is, uh, I think the hardest part about getting up for a real fight is uh, not the fight itself, just everything leading up to it. Like the fight itself is so fast, it's over so fast. Like I can't even remember it, but I think leading up to it, like especially with my first fight, I trained for like, I mean, I've been training, you know, since I was a kid, but fight training, I was like fight training for a year for my first fight because uh, my first two opponents pulled out in the last, like the week of the fight. So, you know, I'm, there's guys, the pros are built for it, but it's a different type of thing when you're, you're constantly thinking about it. You know, you're thinking about, oh, am I gonna eat this? What's the other guy gonna eat? You know, what, am I gonna stop working out now? Cause maybe the other guys are working out a little bit more. It's kind of like all consuming. Um, so I think uh, that's, I, I, think, I think one of the things is, that's the suckiest part. And the actual fight itself is like easy. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's over, it's over just like that. Yeah, fight culture itself is quite interesting. Yeah. Okay. Um, I know in your work, you've got, you, you mentioned you, uh, UFC being a tight community. Uh, who are some fighters that you're on, you're close with, or that you're like, yeah, that you're friends with on, what, on social media? Or well, I mean, I'm not, I wouldn't say I'm super tight with anybody. My mom, my mom's uh, Facebook friends is Mark Hunt, though. Uh, you know, she's like liking all his, uh, all his uh, kids' pictures and stuff like that, like, because uh, he was one of the first guys that uh, post one of my, uh, artworks of him as his Facebook profile picture. And she handed him, like, Mark, that's my son. Uh, you better give him a call. He was how, how, did she find, how did she find him in the first place? Or how did you find her in the first place? Oh, I told her about it. I was like, Mom, this fighter that I, that I love, uh, he posted my, you know, my artwork as his Facebook picture. She's like, what's his name? Let me see him. Let me, <laughs> where is he on Facebook? <laughs> so, uh, um, um, style bender. And I follow each other. Uh, he well, but he's he, he loves all types of art. He's, he's in the dance, music, um, anime, uh, all types of stuff. So, um, but yeah, um, I, 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 I I'm a couple. I'm on Instagram friends with a couple of fighters. <laughs> um, who is the most underrated? Not that you've been watching it for for a while. And, yeah. Who's the most underrated fighter in the Well, okay. So I've been to Vegas a bunch of times, especially doing work for Reebok in the UFC. I never gambled, but the one time I ever did was uh, on the Ultimate Fighter finale, uh, you know, sports betting. And because I knew uh, Kelvin Gastelum was the bomb, <laughs> I've been watching. Um, this UFC show called The Ultimate Fighter. And uh, I, he was like the last one picked. Um, and I remember I was like, dude, I'm pulling my money on this guy. He's definitely gonna win. And uh, I think he did a lot better than uh, a, lot of people, a lot of people thought he did just because of the way he looks. You know, maybe he doesn't look like the prototype um, killer, but uh, I think even, even to this day of uh, people, but he's still an active fighter. Oh yeah, I mean he he challenged Stylebender, um, you know, gave him a good fight. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Any questions before I keep going? Go ahead. What are some of the fighters? What have some of the fighters said about your work? Um, you How have they responded? Well, you know, I, I feel like the coolest, uh, one of the coolest experiences I had was uh, what I talked about a little bit about earlier when I was painting at the Athletes Retreat. And I got to, you know, the, since I was painting in the middle of the, basically the, the, the center of the hotel, um, the fighters that would come up to me were the ones who were really into art. So, 
some guys I talked to was uh, Matt, the immortal Brown. Uh, I think his his brother worked uh, as a as a graphics effects and motion designer. I had a good conversation with him. I uh, uh, spoke with Gavin Tucker, who I did some artwork uh, for um, because he was a musician. I think an artist in college. Um, uh, Angela Hill, um, I think, also did art in college. So. Uh, yeah, I think it's the same. I think uh, in general, people appreciate how um, my paintings kind of stay true and pay respect to the martial arts. Um, yeah, I think. No one ever said, okay, that doesn't look like <laughs> No, fortunately not. I try really, if I'm doing a likeness, I gotta make sure you know it's on point. I'm not trying to disrespect these guys. <laughs> Yes. So, what would be? What are some dream projects for you? Man, I feel like I've had a lot of dream projects. You know, working with the UFC was amazing. Um, all the Reebok projects with the UFC, uh, Nike. I, I even got to do a Game of Thrones project. Um, but uh, you know, Everlast. I, th I think one of my childhood bucket list dreams is uh, do a run of comic book covers. That's something I feel like I got to do. Um, also, um, you know, I listen to a lot of stuff when I'm painting podcasts and stuff. I'm an avid uh, sci-fi and fantasy audiobook listener too. I, and of course, I respect the great uh, fantasy sci-fi uh, book cover illustrators, Presetta and those. Uh, I'd love to take a, take a shot at that, something like that. Um, it's a lot, a lot of things. Um, as a commercial artist who has transitioned into a successful freelance, to being a successful freelance artist and now a successful gallery artist, uh, what advice would you give artists who are working, currently working in a studio or a firm that want to make the leap into doing their own thing? Hmm. Um, Maybe comment about how you yourself made that leap. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, for me, it was, um, I think, uh, being an art director in advertising, I had, I was fortunate to dip my toes in all types of creative media. So, you know, I was working with photographers for commercial photo shoots, directors to do uh, 60 second ads. I used my graphic design skills to do layouts and you know, even draw myself. So, I was able to quickly, I mean, not quickly, over a couple of years, figure out what I wanted to do, was paint and draw. And then I had the luxury of trying to, of doing my own stuff on the side, you know, because I had a, a real job. Uh, so basically what I'm saying is I think, uh, <laughs> Uh, in advertising, advertising. Uh, like the New York Rangers, I worked with Chicago Cubs, just all types of cool brands, but I felt like the most satisfaction I got was when I was just doing a painting or a drawing and I was responsible for the finished project. So I think what's the most important is to figure out what you enjoy the most, because I enjoy doing the other things. I, I enjoy doing layouts and stuff like that, but I enjoy painting and drawing the most. So I think the quicker you can find what you enjoy doing the most and then hone in on that and create a lot of work based around that um, is probably the quickest way uh, to launch a successful freelance art career like based on your own work. I'd also say that um, now more than ever, uh, not to be afraid of uh, creating around the subject matter or style that's uh, unique, you know, like even if you've never seen it before, or how, no matter how weird you think it is, or because of the internet, um, it's easier to be discovered. And um, I think more and more art directors and brands, you know, if that's something you're going for, or just people in general are drawn to uh, things that have their own voice, you know, that don't necessarily, uh, are, that are not necessarily like everything else. So I, I think it's not, uh, today more than ever, it's not necessary to be a jack of all trades and be able to like, be able to do background work, be able to do character work and stuff like that. If you want to just do a bunch of pinups of people fighting, you know, you could do that. 
and uh, it's worked out for me so far. Awesome. Sounds good. Well, uh, I think with that, I want to say thank you and thank you all for being here.